hope you're all doing well. This is our last lecture of this very strange and seemingly endless semester. Um, so we are going to be talking today about Angela Carter's story, The Company of Wolves, as well as Maxine Hong Kingston's um, story. It's a memoir, though. Um, no name woman. So we're going to start with the Carter. Um, I really like the pairing of these stories because I think that at first they don't seem like super um, like similar to each other, right? Like one's like this weird like fairy tale reimagining type situation with like a bunch of werewolves um, and like Little Red Riding Hood in it, um, and one is like the imagined story um, behind the true story of Kingston's aunt who no one in her family will talk about. Um, but ultimately I think both of these stories are about um, female sexual agency and the way that um, like virginity is kind of fetishized in a lot of different cultures um, for cis women in particular and um, the way that the transformation from like girl to woman is seen as a specifically sexual metamorphosis um, hinging on menstruation and a woman's uh, like transition from being like not fertile to fertile um, which is ultimately like a, a pretty narrow definition of womanhood right because it only applies to cis women who are fertile um, and that's that's not true of all women. So we're going to kind of talk about these two stories today. Um, and we will start with Angela Carter. Um, <clears throat> so these stories are like right, like one after the other in the anthology, which is like convenient. Um, so Angela Carter, um, <clears throat> I love her. She was British. Um, she died pretty young and she not only wrote like these sort of reimagined fairy tales um she actually also like translated fairy tales so she was truly like an expert in fairy tales and she also wrote this book called um the Sadian woman which is about the Marquis de Sade's uh like pornography basically um and how it could be relevant in a modern context, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, the Marquis de Sade is like a French author uh, who wrote really like racy erotica and is kind of like the, the considered like the grandfather of like porn as we know it. Um, and so she wrote about that. So this, this story and like much of her work is very specifically concerned with like the erotic and female sexuality. Um, okay. So <clears throat> This story is not really a fairy tale, um, but it is based on a fairy tale. And so, um, I asked you guys a question in um, the discussion forum that is basically like, what do you think a fairy tale is? So I want you to kind of think about like how we recognize fairy tales, what a fairy tale is, what it means to us. Um, I think for most of us who grew up in like, you know, I guess you guys mostly grew up in like the 2000s, I grew up in the 90s. So for like most of us, uh, I think Disney was kind of like our main exposure to fairy tales. So, you know, something like The Little Mermaid um, or like Cinderella or Frozen, all of those are based on like old, um, fairy tales and then they're just sort of like reimagined into cartoons for children um, <clears throat> and the definition of a fairy tale is contentious so there's really no like one clear agreed upon definition for it um, so if you look in the dictionary um, you will get something along the lines of a fairy tale is a children's story about magical and imaginary beings and lands. Um, which like, fair enough, right? So like Little Red Riding Hood, the magical being in that story uh, is a talking wolf, right? Um, the, I don't know. This, this, okay, I'm, I'm thinking of the Three Little Pigs, but I actually don't remember what happens in that. 
Is that all? That's also also talking wolves, and I guess talking pigs too. Pigs who can build houses. Um, so sort of magical. <laughs> um, <clears throat> other definitions of fairy tales um, focus on the fact of transformation. So transformation is like a central aspect of many fairy tales. And if you even think about something like, like if you think about the fairy tales you know from Disney, like Cinderella transforms into this like beautiful princess wearing glass slippers for one night at the ball, right? Um, Ariel turns into a human in her story. Uh, what else happens? Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of transformation. In Mulan, um, she like dresses as a man the whole time, which is a kind of transformation. And there's also like that dragon who is like a spirit, it's just kind of a transformation. So I think this idea of like change and transformation as a theme in fairy tales is like very prevalent. And it's something that I think Carter is really focusing on here, right? Because what is a werewolf, if not like a creature, um, you know, like whose entire existence is dictated by this uncontrollable transformation between man and beast. Um, <clears throat> another thing I think is important about fairy tales is that um, they're often for children and they often have some kind of moral or lesson at the end. So in Little Red Riding Hood, oh no, there's termites coming in. I hope that doesn't, I hope that doesn't become a thing right now. Um, so in Little Red Riding Hood, for example, the lesson of that story, the traditional story, is uh, something along the lines of like, stay on the path, listen to your mom, you know, follow instructions, um, because if Little Red Riding Hood had just like not let this wolf trick her, her grandma would have lived. Um, but in this story, the lesson is different, right? Um, okay, so the story's setting is within the forest and on page 1222 our narrator which is like a collective um first person narrator so in in the voice of we um this narrator tells us you are always in danger in the forest where no people are um and this is like a very like old and long-standing literary tradition um in which the forest is seen as like a dangerous place where humans do not belong. So like the devil lives in the forest. And in this story, the wolves live in the forest and the werewolves live in the forest. And we know there's a distinction between the wolves and the werewolves, right? Because in the end, like there's this huntsman who is sort of wolfy and he like says that like the wolves are his brothers, I think. Um, but those wolves aren't werewolves. So like not every wolf in this story is a werewolf. Um, but you can never be too careful, I guess, right? Okay, so from the beginning, um, we are told this sort of like lore of the werewolf. So before we get to our main like cin uh, Cinderella, like Little Red Riding Hood type story, we get a bunch of different um, wolf lore. And so our first story, uh, we have this hunter who digs a pit and the wolf turns into a man after he's killed. And then, this is still on page 1222, we have this story of a wedding party. So a witch from up the valley once turned an entire wedding party into wolves because the groom had settled on another girl. She used, them to, she used to order them to visit her at night from spite and they would sit and howl around her cottage for her, serenading her with their misery. Um, so that story takes place on a wedding night, and then there's a longer story about a woman in their village who married a man who vanished clean away on her wedding night. So this guy gets up to go to the bathroom, um, which is like in an outhouse, and he never comes back. And she mourns him and eventually remarries, and then this guy comes back after like being a wolf 
Um, and when he comes back on page 1223, listen to what he says. Here I am again, missus. Get me my bowl of cabbage and be quick about it. Then her second husband came in with wood for the fire, and when the first one saw she had slept with another man and worse, clapped and worse, clapped his red eyes on her little children, who'd crept into the kitchen to see what all the din was about, he shouted, I wish I were a wolf again to teach this whore a lesson. So a wolf he instantly became and tore off the eldest boy's left foot before he was chopped up with the hatchet they used for chopping logs. But when the wolf lay bleeding and gasping its last, the pelt peeled off again and he was just as he had been years ago when he ran away from his marriage bed so that she wept and her second husband beat her. So I think there's a pretty like clear, um, I guess sort of lesson here or um, at least point being made here about the way that like this woman couldn't win, right? Like if she had stayed faithful to her first husband, she would have just had to like end her life then and there, um, never knowing whether or not he would come back, and, um, you know, having remarried, she is beaten by her new husband for having had, a, like, feelings for another person once, who she doesn't want to, like, watch bleed to death in front of her, um, and the first husband still feels entitled to her as his wife and not only like her as his wife but like her cooking right so he gets there and the first thing he asks her to do is this domestic chore you know he doesn't say like oh my god like I missed you so much I'm so sorry I was like a wolf you know um but I'm back like how are you he doesn't do any of that he instead is just kind of like de making these like traditional like husband type of demands and putting her immediately into the place of like his domestic servant um, okay, there's like termites coming into my house, so I'm just going to briefly close my blinds and maybe like turn a couple lights off so they stop doing this. So, sorry, just taking a brief break here. termite swarm in my kitchen, but oh well. Um, hopefully they'll go somewhere else now that the light is off. Um, so back to our lecture. Um, okay, so these stories all take place on wedding nights because the thing that a wedding night has in common is that it is traditionally the night when a woman loses her virginity um, and she is supposed to sort of go from girl to woman. Um, on her wedding night and so obviously there's like some issues with that because that means that a man is in charge of when a woman grows up and like when she sees herself as an adult um and that's you know so that basically robs her of all of her agency um so that's a problem okay um, all right, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick this lecture up, like, when the termites stop swarming so that I can, uh, turn the lights off in here because there's, like, a lot of termites in my house right now, as I think you can see. Um, so I will, <laughs> I will revisit this, um, in an hour or so. Um, okay, so we are ending at the, the first the first story. So we'll pick this back up when we get to Red, Little Red Riding Hood, or, or Red Riding Hood, we may just want to call her. Um, all right. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to you guys soon.